I'm Elizabeth Barker, Director and Chief Curator of the Mead Art Museum, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this keynote conversation marking the launch of the year-long exhibition Picturing Enlightenment, Tonka in the Mead Art Museum at Amherst College. Our program this afternoon promises to be as thoughtfully wrought and as enlightening as the intricate paintings featured in the exhibition. First, each of our speakers will make a brief, approximately 20-minute pre presentation on their respective subjects of Buddhist art and religion. Then they will take the stage together for a conversation exploring points of connection and convergence in their considerations. At the conclusion of that 20-minute conversation, our speakers would welcome questions from the audience. After the question period, I hope that you will join us in the museum's galleries for a public reception. There, we'll have the opportunity to see the exhibition of Tibetan scroll paintings featured in today's program and to speak informally with our distinguished guests. As always, we would be grateful if you would please turn off your mobile phones and if you would refrain from taking flash photographs during the discussion. I'll introduce both of our speakers now so that you won't have to hear any more from me and you'll hear only from them for the rest of the afternoon. Marilyn Ree received her bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees from the University of Chicago, where her studies focused on the topic of Chinese Buddhist sculpture. After serving as a visiting lecturer at Harvard, Mount Holyoke, and Amherst College, Professor Ree joined the faculty at Smith. There, she has taught Asian art and East Asian studies since 1976, and has held the Jesse Wells Post Chair in Art and East Asian Studies since 1992. Her research in Chinese, Central Asian, Tibetan, and Korean Buddhist art has taken her across Asia and Europe and garnered awards from the Smithsonian Institution, American Council of Learned Societies, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Her books and articles have addressed the early Buddhist art of China and Central Asia with particular attention to the cave temples of Tian Lung Shan, the relationships between the art of India, Central Asia, and China during the Tang Dynasty, and the chronologies of Chinese Buddhist art of the Six Dynasties and Su period. Her exhibitions include presentations of Tibetan Buddhist art in projects shown here at Amherst and at Smith, and in the major internationally traveling exhibition, which she co-curated with Robert Thurman, Wisdom and Compassion, the Sacred Art of Tibet. Her ongoing projects include another exhibition that she is co-curating again with Professor Thurman, Clear Light, Magic Body, Art of the Tibetan Renaissance, scheduled to open at the San Diego Museum of Art in 2015. The Mead is fortunate to have secured Professor Rees and Professor Thurman's contributions for a forthcoming catalog of Amherst Tonka collection, planned for publication next summer. Robert Thurman received his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees from Harvard. He studied Tibetan Buddhism in monasteries in India, where he first came to know the Dalai Lama. When he was ordained in the 1960s, he became the first American monk in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. He gave up his robe several years later to enter the academy. Many of you will know Professor Thurman from his service as professor of religion here at Amherst from 1973 to 1988, where he was an inspirational teacher whose name still arises daily in conversations on our campus and where he became a moving force in the Five Colleges Buddhist Studies program. In 1988, Professor Thurman moved to Columbia University, where he holds the J. Song Kappa Chair in Indo-Tibetan Buddhist Studies and serves as the president of the American Institute of Buddhist Studies and of Tibet House U.S., which he helped to found. Professor Thurman's publications include studies in the history of Asian monasteries and in the critical philosophy of the world's religions, as well as critical translations of key Tibetan and Sanskrit philosophical works, such as the 14th century Essence of True Eloquence and the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Professor Thurman also finds time to act as one of our country's most prominent public intellectuals, whose spoken and published views on the current Tibet-China situation and whose proposed approaches to a peaceful solution have shaped our national understanding of the subject. Please join me in welcoming Bob and Marilyn to Amherst. Thank you. Thank you, Libby. It's very nice to be here. 
Oh, there is everybody back in Amherst. You didn't mention I actually have a master's degree from Amherst College. Uh, because if, you, if you've been here for 15 years, they figure they give you something. <laughs> <laughs> you survived for 15 years. And then, of course, I did what is considered a cardinal sin at Amherst, which is I left. <laughs> and, uh, but you, you're considered insane to leave this paradisal place and go, to the, go back to the Big Apple, so-called Big Apple, where I was born. But, uh, but anyway, I was drawn down there and torn and leaving Amherst, which is such a wonderful place. And it's very nice to be here and seeing all uh, many familiar faces, old friends, and especially with Marilyn. And Marilyn and I have written so many books together. In thinking about what to say about this uh, in, the, in this event, I was looking back last night through the different forewords that we've written and introductions and prefaces to the different books. I think we've written four books or... Three or four, something like that, on, on Tibetan art of different eras and different types and different things. And actually, there, it's, like a, it's like a book in itself, all the introductions. And, um, but now is the time is uh, very brief, so I won't. Uh, but it's a, it's a joy to be here and talk with Marilyn. And uh, you did mention our clear light and magic body, which is the, was the reincarnation of the wisdom and compassion show that we did. But uh, we still haven't gotten that one. It's getting slowed down. Well, actually, Marilyn also is so busy. We're both so busy. I'm translating 3,756 books in the Tibetan tenure. And Marilyn is, doing, is dealing with 3 million art objects from India to China, I think, especially China, right? Like, what, are you on volume four now, Marilyn? Volume four. It's like the masterwork of all of the, the whole movement of the sculpture and the vision of the Buddha in different cultures from India to China and how it unfolded and, and flourished in China. Marvelous, marvelous tomes that you are producing. So we've both been too busy. Anyway, so today I guess my role in introducing uh, to some of you, many of you may be familiar with Tibet, but may, many of you also may be familiar with Tibet in the wrong way. And so what I want to begin is, uh, my, my talk I'm entitling it at the last minute, I entitled it Tibet, its civilization and its art. And uh, the first point I want to make is that Tibet has been trapped, is trapped in various stereotypes and myths. But the myth that it is trapped in is not the myth of Shangri-La, as people, have, people wrongly say, and there's like a trend in scholarship nowadays uh, to, uh, to think that somehow some people think Tibet is Shangri-La. <clears throat> but that isn't the case, actually. The scholars who write that are confused, I think. They read a few popular books or something, and they think these have a wide sway. Myself, in, the, in my history of having been all over the country speaking about Tibet, and uh, not only on a scholarly level, but also on the political level, the, the genocide that's going on in Tibet till today, the, for, that has been going on for 60 years, and, uh, and the difficulties, the destruction of the Tibetan ecosystem, headwaters of all the Asian rivers, the um, propaganda put out by the People's Republic of China and so on. In dealing with that, I you know, get calls from truck drivers on radio shows and things like that, and I have my pulse on the popular idea of Tibet. And the popular idea of Tibet actually is of a feudal theocracy, a dark and horrible place, a sort of backward thing, and where, you know, where they're sort of, maybe it's not such a bad thing that the communists like wrecked it you know, and tried to bring modernity and put in a few roads and some electricity for themselves, for them to colonize Tibet. And uh, that is the dominant image in which Tibet is stuck, basically a victim of Chinese propaganda. And of course, the, the powers of the world, the political powers of the world, looking away from the destruction of this people, who will, are compared, like I've had many deb debates with uh, well-meaning and well-intentioned and misinformed Chinese, who, but who, when they really get pressed and they get down to it, they sort of will say to one, uh, many times this has occurred to me, they will say, well, you did in all your Native Americans, why can't we do in our Tibetans and, and enjoy that vast area? So they admit it, actually. They, even Democratic, Chinese Democratic students type, they say, well, it's just such a big place and there's hardly any Tibetans, why can't we go there? Uh, luckily, they can't really be there at that high altitude without getting ill, so th that's why there's not 100 million of them already, as Mao vowed there would be. But anyway, therefore, the first myth is the myth for example, George H.W. Bush wrote an article in Newsweek when he was head of the CIA and he, was in China. he had been ambassador to China. And he, re he reproduced the waxwork museum below the Potala that used to be there that showed some lama putting a baby under the cornerstone of a monastery and 
you know, basically Borgia-esque sort of atrocity wielding llamas is kind of what they, what they put out. They had Western propagandists like the type you see in the film Reds. Now, they had that sort of collection of mostly English uh, journalists, but some American ones, like Anna Louise Strong and others, and uh, they put out this kind of propaganda. That's the main image in which Tibet is imprisoned, not Shangri-La at all. There are very few people who think about it as Shangri-La. And that image came around also from a scholarly, um, a scholarly image of Tibet, where Tibet is the place where late Indian Buddhism went and was preserved in its fullest form. If you divide Indian Buddhism, you know, Buddhist, Buddhism's history in India over three, five hundred year periods from roughly mid first millennium BCE until around a thousand CE when, when Buddhism was wiped out in India more or less by uh, Islamic uh, Tajiks and Persian invasions and also Hindu kings recruiting manpower to fight, off, fight them off, both sides, the sort of the militarization of North India. Um, during that 1500 years, if you divide it in three 500 year periods, you have the emphasis on monastic Buddhism, which now we, the, the remaining main strand of being Theravada Buddhism. You have then the emphasis on Mahayana Buddhism for another 500 years, where uh, Mahayana Buddhism gets more into non dualism. My cup friend uh, mentioned to me, Andy was here, and saying he didn't get the non dualism because he comes from the Burmese tradition. And then, uh, you know, Mahayana non-dualism, where Buddha is, is depicted in a more sort of divine manner. They call it the Buddha divinization process. And it's considered like a, a decadence, a compromise with Hinduism in the narrative. And then about in this, the last 500-year period, from 500 of the Common Era to 1,000 of the Common Era, you have Tantra starts getting really strong. You have these Mahasiddhas who are sort of like hippies, kind of Walt Whitman types. <laughs> Thoreau, they have bones in their hair and they live in burning grounds and they have like bone earrings and they run around and they have girlfriends sometimes or boyfriends. And so this, you know, in the British narrative, this is total decadence and like, you know, sex and violence, uh, eros and thanatos out in plain view. And, you know, it's, it's not like Freud brought it out. It's some sort of primitive thing of some Asian people. And so, so therefore, it fits in the trope that has a, is a kind of a colonial trope. And then, of course, India became all like messed up and decadent and then conquered by first Muslims. And then finally, the British came and saved the day. <laughs> and the you know, white man's burden, and they lifted up this like, long, slow process of decay from good old Buddha, who was like a Socrates in an orange toga who didn't drink Ritsina or sacrifice, <laughs> sacrifice chickens to Asclepius, but otherwise then just downhill from there. So, so that is the colonial trope. Anywhere they go to conquer, they have to prove that the culture was collapsing on the way and that they picked it up. It's just a natural thing. And then Tibet gets caught in that because then that late decadent form of Buddhism, which has the monastic vow, there were more Theravada vow holding Tibetan monks and nuns in Tibet before the communists destroyed it than in all the Theravada countries combined. So in fact, it's a very vibrant Theravada Buddhist country. Tibet was. And they had maybe 200, no, maybe four, five, six hundred thousand uh, monks and nuns in Tibet. And they all had Theravada vows, all the monks did. Not that they kept them all that well, all of them, but they did hold them and they were initiated in them, you know, the mendicant, male and female mendicant vows and the layperson's vows. Then they had the, the Mahayana, you know, where they see the Buddha as a kind of divine manifestation everywhere. And then Vajrayana, where there's, uh, there's this sort of radical uh, plumbing of the unconscious and it went there. But then and, th and then the Tibetans were backward people in one sense. They were actually a, a forward people in some definitions of forward in that they were military conquerors and they had a pretty big empire and they only didn't spread as far as Genghis Khan because their numbers were less and the one virtue that they had as far as all their neighbors were concerned, you know, this is middle first millennium of the common era, their one great virtue was that they liked living at high altitude so they just came and looted and pillaged and then they went home. <laughs> They didn't settle down except in the Silk Route, where they, where they kind of were taking taxes and gaining wealth, so they liked to stay there. For a century or two, they did. But they were pretty rough, actually, and pretty awful. But they had some kings at a certain point who, recognized, who looked around and saw Buddhism as important in post-Gupta India, as central to the culture of post-Gupta India. They saw it as central to the Tang Dynasty. They saw it in the Central Asian states. And the, those kings at, at a certain point who were tired of dealing with their troops 
and their rebellious barons, you know, who would be ready to revolt against them at any particular moment. They saw Buddhism as a useful thing, very much in the same centuries as the Japanese received Buddhism via Korea, China and Korea. And the, the Japanese sort of warlords saw Buddhism as a way of elevating one, one clan sort of above the others as protectors of Buddhism. And, uh, they, you know, they had a practical element to it. And they also saw it as with its ideas of peace, and education, and nonviolence, and these ideals, which they didn't live up to at all in the beginning. But they saw that as useful to, to because, you know, you, to have a military empire, you always have to have something else to conquer. To keep the troops satisfied, they have to have more loot. And it gets tiresome when you, and then you run out of people, and then you, you know, people who you conquer don't enjoy it. So it's, 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 it's more peaceful to be at home. And then they started to adopt this thing. And then it fit with the history of India because at the end of the first millennium, the Indians were getting overrun by Central Asian invasions, uh, tribes unified by a kind of version of Islam, a militant version of Islam coming in. And the, one of the things they did in India was they destroyed the root of Buddhism in India, which were the monasteries, monastic universities. The Amherst Colleges, the Harvard Universities of India at that time were Nalanda, Vikramashila, Wallabi, all these. They were like dozens of very important monasteries, some with 10,000, 12,000 uh, scholars there. And not only teaching Buddhism, also medicine and architecture and art and many things. And so these were all shattered and destroyed. And Buddhism had always been, and Buddhism always is, in tension with any native culture because it teaches people the teaching, famous teaching of selflessness. And, you know, people in their culture, they want to be patriotic. They want to be, I'm a Tibetan, I'm an Indian, I'm a Bengali, you know. And then Buddhism says, well, you're not really a Bengali. You're not really an American. You're not really this and that. You are a process that is flexible and resilient and related to things. And so don't get all rigid and freaked out about your, your fixed identity. That sort of, and so it has, a, it has an ameliorating and a melting effect on cultural archetypes and so on. So anyway, uh, then Buddhism entering there uh, with its different arts and sciences and meditational things and very key, the institution of monasticism, which historically has been a kind of, uh, you can see in Asia and elsewhere even, although it's not normally understood that way, but it, it, if you look at it carefully, it is, a, it is the one institutional antidote that has worked at some times in history as an antidote to militarism, the institution of militarism, and where you don't have any monasticism effectively, which is like a Protestant culture like America, what do we have? We have the Pentagon and an immense defense budget, and some, you gotta, then, which has to always go somewhere to conquer something, what, 170 bases around the world and all our money is there, right? And we have two or three wars going and so on. That's the typical. And no monasticism. And because monasticism as an institution is an amazing thing where it puts young men, especially women, are more peaceful to start with. But, but not all of them, of course. It's a very tough one. But basically they are. And because they're more sensible and they're more aware of the interconnectedness of things and they're more naturally empathetic because they have that shocking experience of having somebody occupying their body for a while, which men, ne men never get to enjoy. And... So, so it's the males that they, who are, you know, will be violent, you know. And so then they go into the monastic thing and they bang their own head against the wall seeking enlightenment and inner conquest instead of conquering the world. And it has a very powerful effect, which is why when they, whenever any culture cuts back on mon monasticism, if you look at history, then their militarism increases. And the uh, Protestant Reformation was a great thing. And of course, at Amherst College, it was like practically like nirvana for the world. <laughs> it's thought of like that. You know, and but it did result in the Northern European sort of conquest of the world, which wasn't that appreciated by the rest of the world, actually, uh, not not as much as we think as we would think. Although there are, never mind, I won't go there. <laughs> okay, so so anyway, in a thousand years, the Tibetans so extremely took to the Buddhist adventure that far from being a conquest militant empire feared by all their neighbors, they became a bunch of wusses. And go money pay me home and making sand mandalas and painting tankas and and anybody could go and trample them and the only reason they survived as long as they did is that they uh, they were in an inaccessible place and not that many people wanted to go there uh, it was a long hike up there up those hills and mountains so their geography kind of protected them and actually the geography will continue to protect them even now even with the Deng Xiaoping's uh, belated attempt to colonize Tibet with massive 
uh, population transfer, which only began in 1993, actually, after the Soviet Union lost its peripheral territories, like Kazakhstan and Ukraine and uh, Baltic areas and other areas. And he freaked out, and then he really built that rail, started the building of that railway, and he really made a big subsidy for people to go up there. But then the, the science, Chinese scientists discovered that when you live at that altitude, if you're from sea, sea level, within a year or two, you have CMS. And they have an acronym for it, so you know it's a real medical thing. <laughs> Chronic mountain sickness, that is. It's, you know, AMS is when you get, you get altitude and you know, freak out and have to be taken down. There's no cure for it. And CMS is where your heart starts to go bad. If you're a woman, you miscarry because you can't form placenta at that out with a little oxygen in the air. So it still will protect, actually, Tibet. But the attempt to colonize is wrecking it. But anyway, that, that's jumping smart. So now, so this is the thing. Now, what is the Buddhist adventure? Very quickly, I'm probably close, almost running out of time. I have another couple of minutes. The Buddhist adventure is that, that they were taken by is the idea that, you know, you could sort of do it on the basis of the Four Noble Truths, but it's really very simple what the Buddhist adventure is. It's an educational adventure, and it is based on the Buddha's discovery that uh, if you learn that there are other people in the world who are as real as you are, and who are as important as you are, and since there are more of them actually in the aggregate, they're more important than you are, and, and therefore you, you unlearn the way we are indoctrinated to think, as my old Mongolian guru used to say, people, everybody goes around secretly thinking, I'm the one. <laughs> Two decades before the Matrix, he went around saying, that's what everybody's thinking. And, and uh, when you think you're the one, Buddha, basically Buddha's insight was, and of course when he got it, he was thinking he was the one, and he went out to meditate a lot and discover what that really meant, because he realized being the one is a hopeless situation. If you are the one, then who else agrees with you if you think you are? Does anybody agree with you? Like right here and now, if everybody thinks they're the main person here, secretly somewhere, then they're paranoid or immediately. Because they know that the person sitting next to them doesn't think so. In fact, that person is thinking they're the one. And they know that they're disagreed with. So if, you're, if you think you're the real, absolutely different from the rest of the universe, central person in the universe, at some deep subliminal, even instinctual level, and maybe at a conscious level, there are various theories, that, that ratify that, then you are in conflict with the universe, basically, and you lose that conflict. I don't think, I mean, maybe the President of the United States thinks he can, he can dominate the world, uh, Putas, they call it, don't they? Most powerful man in the world. It's a kind of a joke. It's a deer in the headlights. Okay, or, or, I don't know, maybe the President Hu Jintao thinks he's the most powerful man in the world. I'm not sure nowadays. So that's the, the Buddhist adventure is that there's an educational, now you can't just say to somebody, oh, you're not the one, give up your self-centeredness and then you'll be happier and better. And so you're ordered morally to do so or, you're, or you, know, you, you should do so type of thing. It's an ought thing. That necessarily doesn't really help. And if we sort of try to suppress our natural egotisms and based on the wrong wiring that we really are the one, then we build breed resentment and we suppress ourselves and then we, we maybe surface nice but inside we're a seething mass of resentment and frustration. So that doesn't really work. And uh, what it is with the Buddhist education is to really, okay, you're the one, well then find the one that you are. Really get in there and really discover like who's the real you. And, be, and apparently their, their, you know, their curriculum report is when you really try to do that, you can't find anyone. <laughs> <laughs> or rather, you find this changing process that is many different things. And you, you're able to incorporate all kinds of sides to your identity that you didn't want to think were there, maybe. And maybe some ones that you were better than you thought were there. But anyway, you begin to become, the more you discover that you're not that fixed, rigid one that you thought was yourself, that never, that's just like this and just like that. You know how people talk, you know. Well, that's just me, they say, you know, when they want to keep up indulgent in a certain habit, you know. But when you go in there and find there is no just me, then you find that me is always changing and living and breathing and interactive. And then you suddenly see what other people are doing. And you begin, eventually, the, guy, the idea is, after seeing through yourself, you become more aware of others. And the minute you become more aware of others, you become more empathetic with them, more compassionate with them, more kind to them. Then they are nice to you. Actually, they like you better. 
they didn't really like you that much when you were like just sort of inferring that they were there, but you weren't really sure. Because <laughs> you were mainly focused on your being there. You were caught up in your own narrative of yourself being there. So that's the main adventure of Buddhism, and it's a complicated education process. The big monasteries were not just praying and being holy. The people who were really doing the education were re-educating themselves in this critical way using wisdom. Meditation is not the main thing either in Buddhism at all. Meditation is a neutral tool. If you meditate on being the one, and this has happened in a few American Dharma centers, if you know the history, uh, and not in, and in Christian churches and synagogues and all the religious movements, that the leaders, uh, you know, uh, get thinking that they're, they don't dislodge the idea that they're the one. And then they meditate on that intensely. And then after many years of deep meditation, they come up with a eureka experience. <laughs> I'm the one, you know. And then they're even more egotistical than they were to start with. And they become cult leaders and it becomes a big pain. So the meditation by itself will not do it. It's a, it's a wisdom which is critical insight into the nature of reality that targets the meditation, which then is a useful tool. And then ethical action and behavior is very key also to calm down this turbulence of, of interaction with others since we're so interconnected with them and, uh, and then provide a kind of more calm lifestyle where you can then begin to, begin to look into yourself, know thyself type of idea like, like you know, the Greek idea and the Amherst College idea, critical wisdom and intelligence, what we teach at Amherst, right? Remember? That's, the Committee on Instruction came, comes up with that every 15 years or 10 years or so. That's the main thing. Now, how, where is that? Now, now, in that, then, one of the reason for the, 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 the surprising thing about Buddha, therefore, is not the discovery of suffering. It's the discovery of happiness. Suffering doesn't take a Buddha or even a smart person to discover. <laughs> you just bang into something and you have a squabble with your mate and you know about suffering. And or your parent or your child. And so Buddha didn't discover suffering, but he discovered a freedom from suffering, he, which we don't even imagine. Nobody tells you you can be free from suffering. Maybe in heaven after you die, or maybe somewhere else, but, or maybe in Shangri-La. Uh, but there's no, you know, we are supposed to be, grown up means being resigned to suffer. Right? And Buddha said, no, that's not necessary. If you understand yourself thoroughly and the nature of the world, the deeper truth and reality of the world is nirvana, is freedom is the realm of freedom from suffering. That was his discovery. And the education leads to that. He has a system of the, either the three education, he calls them, three higher educations, or the Eightfold Path. There's the various ways in which he does it. So, so that was his discovery, this discovery of happiness. And the reason I mention that is then, the hard thing to do for a person mired in suffering, as we tend to be, is to imagine that there could be a way of not suffering. It's very difficult to do. And therefore, there's a, f a very important form of Buddhism that conforms with the type of Hindu asceticisms that were existing in India at the time. Or well, they weren't really Hindu at that time. They were Vedic, you could say. And these were people who were sought to escape the world, actually, kind of annihilate themselves, but on the idea that the real self is something disconnected from the whole universe. And if you get rid of all your connections to everything, you'll go into this vast real self, and this self will be cool. It won't have to wash dishes. It won't have to worry about things. It won't have to worry about other people bugging them. It'll be the totality of the universe is you'll be your real self and all the world will just be an illusion and you can just forget about all your worries and about all the other people who don't appreciate you to the degree that you appreciate yourself <laughs> so that so the, there is a type of buddhism that has finds it so difficult to imagine that being here in an, as an embodied being interacting with others could be a uniformly blissful experience where there would be freedom from suffering that's so hard to imagine, and I must say it really is, that they, that they just come up with this idea that nirvana is somewhere else. But then in the non-dualism that my colleague brought up, my friend brought up when, before the talk, then, they, then in the Mahayana, the Buddha critiques uh, the different movements and sutras and things that are from the Mahayana, and according to the Mahayanas, these do come from Buddha, and the Buddha critiques this idea that nirvana is somewhere else, because to be the real truth, to be the real reality, it cannot be a relational thing that has flaws, you know, because all relational things are made of parts and causes, and then they fall apart, you know, there's a cause of their destruction. So they're not stable and reliable. Like a relative pleasure cannot be a temporary relief from suffering. It's temporary because it's caused by certain things, and then it collides with something. You know, you overeat or you overdo or you whatever it is. You know, somebody takes it away from you. 
So it has to, so nirvana, if the true reality of life and of the world, of the universe, which Buddha proclaimed, is nirvana, it's already here. <laughs> I know it doesn't seem like it, particularly when you're trying to stay awake in a talk on a, <laughs> on a Friday afternoon. But nirvana has to technically be already here, and it's just our ignorance that prevents us from understanding that. And our ignorance that makes us feel separate from everything else here and makes us feel afraid of it all and therefore suffer, collide with it, and, and have problems, you know, right? So that's where art comes in. Art in Buddhism is all different kinds of ways and techniques and methods. The word that I think best translates art is upaya, uh, which means this kind of stratagem. But the stratagem is a stratagem to get people to, have, to become motivated to see a goal. And that goal is freedom from suffering. And so that goal is that the beauty in the universe, you know, art tries to, even if it looks at something ugly, it's, it's trying to find the beauty in a dung heel, you know, like our dear Emily Dickinson here across the street, you know, she would find beauty in like a drop of dew in the morning or she would see the lamps of heaven, you know, hanging celestial carriages and things, when it's seeing little insect or spider's webs with dew on it in the morning, that's the thing. So in an ordinary thing, she would see something exquisite and beautiful. And so art does that, and Buddhist art does that in a very conscious and structured way. And the art of seeing these kind of more amazing side of the universe. And the Tibetans developed what had long developed in India, and one of the problems of studying Tibetan art is that Indian pictorial art is totally destroyed by the climate and by the Muslim presence because of their anti-idolatry thing. There's hardly any left. Ajanta, a very little pictorial art, right? The, like cloth painting, for example, like Tankas. There must have been millions of them in India. There are many references to them in literature, but there's hardly any existing except from the first millennium, from the pre-Muslim time. You know, and therefore, when people talk of Indian painting, they think of Mughal painting, Kangra Valley, or something more recent. But, so we don't know those antecedents of the, except a little in Nepal, of the Tibetan painting tradition, but it is the continuum of that. And this I learned from my colleague Marilyn, who I'm going to cede the floor to in one second, as I know I've taken my time. But um, Marilyn taught me this wonderful thing when we worked together here at the Reed, and we did this little book called From the Land of Snows, Buddhist Art of Tibet, in an exhibit that we did here in, I think, 19... 84, was it? It probably is in here, the date, yes, 1984. And it was the first book we did together, this little like thing, and uh, Mead paid for it, actually. <laughs> and it was really nice. Uh, <laughs> we had a lot of fun, and I learned a lot, but no, I don't want to take time because I want to hear going to talk. But what I wanted to say is that she came up with this marvelous concept, and all the people, nobody actually in art history at that time really studied specifically Tibetan art as their main thing. So Tibetan art was always approached as a sort of ancillary or an offshoot of Indian art or Chinese art. There wasn't even knowledge much of Central Asian art, I think. Don't correct me if I'm misrepresenting it, but it was sort of a, it was sort of a side channel for that. And Marilyn, however, put her, put her energy into it and her vision. And she made this painting on the cover of this book, and you can't see it very well maybe, but you'll see she has a picture of the same thing. This is the Potala, and she'd never seen the Potala. Marilyn has, Marilyn has never been to Tibet, uh, but it's a fabulous painting of the Potala, and we had the actual painting in the exhibit, and the Dalai Lama liked it, I think, even more than the Tankas <laughs> when he saw it. He liked it, and then the museum went on, and it was in 11 museums in six countries over the next decade, you know, from, from having been here. So it's really kind of fun, you know. And anyway, she, oh yes, and the central concept that she taught me was how the Tibetan art in its high point, which really starts in the 14th, 15th century, contrary to what the antique dealers think, it really reaches its synthesis in the 1400s, uh, the way that she can explain it. And uh, then it really flowers up until the 18th century, really, and then it gets a little, like, a little lazy, you know. But, um, the essence of it is, is there are these different terms we played with. I forgot which is your favorite now, Marilyn, but one that I like is surreal naturalism or realistic supernaturalism or realistic surrealism or naturalistic surrealism. In other words, it combines realism of detail, modeling in the best examples of it, and sort of jewel-like vision, even vision of nature, you know, landscape or something. With a, with a presentation of a being that is completely like an alien, like alien, or like either fierce or erotic one, that is uh, like a divine being, that is uh, like an angel, uh, extraordinary. And by the naturalism of the way in which it is conveyed subliminally, it makes this like supernatural thing 
real, it seem realistic subliminally to the viewer. And therefore, sort of comes, brings, it, brings that idea that there is the possibility of these higher beings who can see that higher world where, or rather this world in its higher reality, where it is blissful and it is beautiful. And you know, beings are already one with their, whatever their final goal is from the cellular level, from the subatomic level, you could say. And there's a dual, it's a dual vision of the universe, actually. And then, the, then the, we structure it in our, in our mental, egotistical, and mutually under, unsatisfying ways in which we relate to the world as a struggle uh, dealing in a situation of inadequacy and want. But the, the imaginative vision then shows how an enlightened being sees it, which is as actually everything is, is beautiful in a very, very drastic way. Even death becomes something that is just a, something to be transitioned, and the, you, the, the mind goes through death, and there is no death in a way. And, and life is eternal, actually, is what they end up with. And, it is, and, and, and it's fun. <laughs> Buddhas apparently have fun. I don't know how. They say that a Buddha, if you become enlightened, you have a vision of beings as if every being was your only beloved child. And then people get all like misty-eyed when they say that, but I think having had four or five children, a few grandchildren, this and that, poor Buddha, <laughs> worrying, worrying about all those people all the time, because it must be frustrating if you see the world as like a jeweling flow of ocean of bliss, of different living forms playing within it, and then you note that they feel all completely freaked out. And like, where's my, like, where's my Mercedes, you know? Like, where's my defense department? And where's my, like, stuck, you know, Wall Street or whatever? <laughs> you know, and they're completely freaking out. Then you see that it's totally unnecessary for them to freak out. Then you just, oh, your whole life becomes the art of helping them find that freedom that you know is the re their real, real reality, not their ignorance perceived reality. You follow, and that apparently is, the, is the, and that's what drives Buddhas in their liberative art, you know. And then Tibetan art is a taste of that. Okay, so I think I, I, I did the I did the tour that I meant to do in the opening remarks. I'm sorry I went a little long. I guess it's your turn, Marilyn. I don't need to introduce you. You already introduced, right? So I will turn my mic off now. Do I? Thank you. Do I go over there and sit down? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <Ralph. laughs> Well, you really got this uh, explanation of the art all set up here. He's great at that. Uh, and also, we're so pleased that the um, director of the Mead Art Museum brought all of the marvelous Amherst Tonkas out of the basement and got them restored and hung up in the galleries in the Mead Art Museum. So today, we're sort of honoring these Tonkas. And let's get started. I'll try and give you some impression of how Bob came to his very nice explanation of, of uh, Tibetan art uh, that he says he learned from me. This is the Potala Palace, of course, in, the, uh, in Lhasa, the capital of Tibet. And I show this for a reason, because it was built in the second half of the 17th century by the fifth Dalai Lama. And inside this building, the fifth Dalai Lama asked the artist Choying Gyatso to come to the building and make many wall paintings. Choying Gyatso turns out to be one of Tibet's greatest artists, and he established a style of painting called the New Menri style of painting. And it is the wall paintings in this Potala Palace that set the tone for one of the great schools of Tibetan religious painting that is more or less the Galugpa style, that is the style of painting used by the uh, Dalai Lama's uh, order, the Galugpa order. And we'll see here is how this uh, plays out with some of the other art of the time. Now, if you go into the Potala Palace, you see that it's very brightly painted, and the colors are very gorgeous and rich. And the wall paintings, which are here, you can see a bit of them here, uh, really do also coordinate with this kind of interior space. And in this Potala Palace, we find not only uh, images of Shakyamuni and so on, but there's a special room that the fifth Dalai Lama made for the eight manifestations of Padma Sambhava. 
Now, the Mead Art Museum has five of the eight manifestations of Padmasambhava in their magnificent tankas that are some of the best in the world of this theme and of the Numenri style of painting, which you can see hanging up in the gallery when we go there. But I show you here these very same so-called eight manifestations of Padmasambhava here in sculpture. And you'll be seeing them in painting in the galleries here. Uh, he's dressed in rather royal robes holding a, a drum and so on. And another one, all of them different forms of Padmasambhava. Now, who is Padmasambhava? We'll get to explaining who he is. But he is actually the founder of the Nyingma order. And the fifth Dalai Lama was very interested in the practices of the Nyingma, as well as, of course, of his own, the Galukpa order. And in these uh, Amherst Tankas, we find very interesting, very interesting for art history, the connection between the Nyingma and the Galugpa in the art itself. Now, not many Tankas will show this, but the Amherst ones do. And it is one of the important uh, uh, rare aspects of these group of Tankas here at Amherst. Uh, they are really quite important, and they set the... Uh, a kind of uh, th uh, kind of standard for the 18th century paintings of Tibet, which are very little studied and very little known about, but which come to fruition in this uh, uh, synthesis of Tibetan art, which Bob mentioned started in the 15th century. Now, this is one wall painting inside the Potala. And with this painting, I want to introduce to you the uh, major characteristics of this new Menri style, because most of the Tibetan tankas here at the Mead are in this new Menri style. We have in the style of, oops, I'm sorry, wait a minute. We have in this style a main figure in the center. And in Tibetan painting, normally you will see a main icon or a main figure. He is a, uh, uh, the first uh, main king of Tibet, Song Zeng Gampo. And Bob actually alluded to him in the fact of unifying Tibet in the 7th century and becoming the first uh, Buddhist king of Tibet. He's shown, shown much larger in size than any other figures in this whole wall painting. He's dressed in royal robes that are very flowing and beautiful in their movements. Uh, the color here is all quite profoundly brilliant and, and gorgeous in green and a kind of reddish orange tone. This is the new Menry characteristic, this kind of green and orangey red tonality of color, which is very important in painting, of course. Now, in this setting, you can see lots of other elements, including landscape. The landscape here is somewhat uh, formalized or rather uh, simplified into conical mountains and so on with trees along the top. Uh, this is uh, uh, typical of the new Menry style, but very compact and dense. In other words, it fills up the whole picture plane with these mountains. And in and among the mountains are other trees. Scale is larger or smaller, it doesn't matter. The scale is not uh, fixed, it is unlimited. Uh, the point of view is not fixed, it is also unlimited. We seem to be looking down on this part and looking straight at this part or looking up at this part. There's no one fixed viewpoint, no one fixed perspective. So it has this kind of unlimited quality to it. And there's two-dimensional space mixed with three-dimensional space. So you have a sense of some three-dimensional landscape here but with a totally two-dimensional uh, square here of, of architecture with monks inside, placed it right on the three-dimensional appearing landscape. So you have different spaces, different dimensions, all juxtaposed together, as well as multiple viewpoints. So nothing is that fixed or limited. Everything is wide open, and they actually end up exploding space and exploding time, too, as we'll see, where past and present all become mixed together and internal and external are shown in the same painting. So this is Tibetan religious aesthetics. And it turns out to look like a kind of surrealism or surrealistic uh, landscape and, and figural juxtapositioning. Uh, 
But it's it's a believable. In other words, we can uh, sort of attest to it uh, as our own world. Now we can look at one of the Tibetan tankas here at the Mead Art Museum. Uh, this is one of three of this of a set that is in this new memory uh, stylistic tradition dating from probably the middle of the 18th century. These tankas, I have to tell you, are really rare, really important, and uh, really unusual in that they are so fine, so exquisitely painted, so perfectly detailed and colored that they stand as a real signpost for other Tibetan art to be understood in these terms and to be dated even and to be uh, really placed in the context of later Tibetan uh, Buddhist art, which is not really studied very well yet. All right, we can recognize this new memory style here, uh, the great uh, wall painting style of the Potala Palace in this blue, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, greenish, tones of the landscape and the orangey red. Just it's brilliant and kind of rich in tones with this red and green color and punctuated by the white lotuses and flowers that adorn the main image. Probably Karshapana Avalokiteshvara, also very interesting iconography with scenes of probably uh, lineage masters uh, that are connected with the worship of this image. But this is still ongoing research. Uh, these, these tankas, I have to tell you, are rather difficult to decipher. So they are a major research project. Uh, so we have this uh, uh, sense of the images existing in a landscape that we can recognize as our own, although it's very difficult to put a deity or a divine image into our totally naturalistic landscape. So the landscape is made a little bit uh, fantastic, a little bit stylized, but charming at the same time. And as I said, many different kinds of viewpoints, looking down, looking in, looking up, and so on. And the images are made very naturalistically in the Menry style, new Menry style. They have a flexibility to the form and a sense of a naturalism to it. So we have no problem accepting the kind of divinity or extraordinariness or supernatural qualities of these great bodhisattvas here, as though being in our own recognizable world. Now, there's another major school at the same time. The new memory is extremely important for its uh, uh, strong designation of one kind of, of art of this uh, later part of Tibetan Buddhist painting. But there's another school that is centered in Dege, in the eastern part of Tibet, in Kham. And for that school, we see not the dense, full landscape with uh, mobile-looking figures, but rather a, a kind of minimalist painting with the, the one figure of Sarasvati here in the center, but very few other attendant figures. And they seem rather small and a little bit uh, stiff in, in posture and so on. But there is the landscape, but the landscape is not so uh, dense and um, compact as in the new memory style, but has a sense of moving back into space with our own atmospheric sky here, for example. But even so, the, the mountains are made somewhat fantastic, but here we have our naturalistic birds and cranes and ducks inhabiting our world. What it does is it draws us into the landscape into this three-dimensional landscape in which this supernatural beautiful deity exists and we go into the world of that supernatural deity and yet it is ours so it it puts our world and the spiritual world together uh, without any hindrance or without any feeling of it being awkward now much earlier than this in the 12th, 13th, 14th century, the art was not uh, not of that uh, later period from the 15th century on with the synthesis of styles, but earlier it was really just two-dimensional art where you have a major image in the center against, of course, here a really dense a red flaming halo. This is Kuru Kula. She helps you to, she helps you to overcome desire. She is a very beautiful figure here, of course, with dancing with her silken scarves and whatnot. But you notice that the landscape here doesn't give you space. 
you're not moving into what feels like our world. It's only a backdrop of some kind of stylized rocks in blue color and kind of outlined in gold. And then the background is totally filled in with a kind of vine motif that doesn't allow space. So it's a two-dimensional painting entirely, which makes it very iconic. But what, what makes the relation between the image and the viewer is the fact that the image is so powerful and right up on the picture plane coming out into our world, not bringing us into her world, but coming out into ours. So it's a different aesthetic, it's a different approach to uh, showing the spiritual, where it, which is very powerful, but it is very iconic on the other hand. But it is this new memory school, and I show you again a tanka from the Mead collection here, which brings us into our own world that is together with the, with the uh, images. In this case, the Kala Chakra, uh, Yabyum image, the union of wisdom and compassion, as seen in the female and male representations here. Bob is an expert on this one. He can tell you about it later, but it's uh, surrounded by these figures here in, in s s kind of floating in the landscape, uh, probably connected with the kind of uh, lineage traditions of practicing the Kala Chakra uh, Tantra. But what I want to emphasize is this, is this uh, beauty of the landscape incorporated with the images in a very profoundly uh, intricate way and dense and naturalistic way in that they seem solid. Whereas the Karmagadri style, totally different as you see, depends on this atmospheric sense of space moving way, way back by the use of alternating planes of color, dark and lighter blue, and giving us a sense of peacefulness and openness of space, which does draw us in, but it doesn't have the sense of complexity and density that we have in the new Menry style. So these are two opposing styles existing at the same time in this 18th century. The figural style of the new Menrys are very naturalistic and beautifully proportioned and have a lot of motion to them, whereas the Karma Gadri style is somewhat uh, formalized and very stiff and minimalist, so that you see only a few images and everything seems kind of reduced to its its essence. This, for example, is the is the uh, death of the Buddha here, and there are only a few people, and the cremation is there, and this is his descent from the triestrums of heaven, where only he and Indra and Brahma are shown. No one else, and the heaven isn't shown. In other words, lacking detail. So these two are diametrically opposed, stylistic uh, representations. Uh, now, this sticking with the same Kala Chakra representation here at the Amherst uh, collection, the very beautiful paintings, if you compare it to a painting of similar type of a union of male and female, this tantric form of the Buddhas, then we see from this 14th century painting here again the monumental quality of an icon. In other words, powerful, large, and impressive, and really sort of in our space without any barrier in front. But all the attendant deities, all the attendant figures here, are just in small kind of checkered spaces, like a grid pattern so that it has no dimension whatsoever. The world is a two-dimensional world in the earlier type of Tibet painting. Now finally here for my section, let me show you a new tanka that was just added to the collection in 2010 uh, by a very uh, generous donor. And it's an extremely beautiful painting of the mid-18th century in the new Menry style tradition. So Amherst College has these really uh, tremendously important uh, paintings from this new Menry uh, tradition of painting in Tibet. Uh, it is of the seventh Dalai Lama, and thanks to the reading by Jay Garfield of all these inscriptions here, you can see them in gold here, and another one here, here, and here, we know what's going on in this painting. This is the seventh Dalai Lama, who died in 1757, and he is showing us here his, the appearance of the Chakrasamvara Tantric Buddha here during his e first initiation of, into the practice of that deity. 
So this is the appearance that comes from the seventh Dalai Lama, and we see it as though it's right out there in space for us to see. In other words, his inner vision, his internality, what he sees as a vision as he's being initiated by the Panchen Lama into the uh, Chakrasambhara Tantra, the seventh Dalai Lama is having this vision here. And so we get to see it along with him. This is, again, something that Tibetan art does all the time. It puts the inner and the outer on the painting simultaneously. So we experience, in a way, the same vision that uh, the seventh Dalai Lama has. Then we have him appearing here, uh, receiving the blissfulness of this kind of appearance, and a dakini uh, apparently appearing before him. And over in this section, and you notice we're moving in a kind of zigzag fashion into the painting, here we see him connected by a golden thread to Sarasvati, who is listed here as appearing before the uh, fifth Dalai Lama, seventh Dalai Lama, I'm sure, sorry. So we have here uh, a, a sequence of visions by the seventh Dalai Lama presented to us in this naturalism, the realistic style of the Numenri style of painting. But and then it has its, its surrealistic parts as well. And we see the, the uh, ambiguity of movement from space to space, and yet you feel the solidity and dimension of this architecture, which is labeled as Tashi Lumpo Monastery, which is the place where the seventh Dalai Lama visited and also gave uh, the Chakrasamvara initiations to others after he had received it from the Panchen Lama, whose la la Lamasari is the Tashi Lumpo. So there are all these connections now that we know because of the inscriptions. So here we can see again the, uh, uh, the beauty of the richness and the realism and this kind of surrealistic juxtapositioning of spaces and scale and small images together with large images and the sense of inner and outer and visionary experience all realistically portrayed in right in front of our eyes. And in this very rich, condensed style of naturalism of the New Menry School. Very dense, dark clouds here frame the hills. Here are the trees along the line of the hill and yet juxtaposed with large trees as well. So no, no particular uh, scale is that we're familiar with, but yet we accept it as being our, our own natural world. There's another one, a famous painting of uh, Sakya Pandita, actually, in this new Menry school in the Newark Museum of Art, which is a similar style as this one, both of them from the middle of the 18th century, where you have waterfalls and lots of rocks, and you can see overhanging cliffs above, and different types and sh uh, sizes of trees and so on. The same kind of style is seen here in the modeling of these rocks, here in the, in the interest in a naturalistic landscape that takes us into the world of the spiritual life of this Lama. OK, we're going to stop here. And Dob and I are now going to continue with looking at some tankas together uh, from the Mead collection. First, I'll let Bob describe a little bit of who this is. This is Padma Sambhava. In the kingdom of Gandhara or Afghanistan, before Gandhara perhaps, they were, the king there couldn't have a male heir. So he was threatening, he was saying to all the religious uh, different people in, of different religions in the country, they should do some ceremonies and rituals, whatever it would take, and he better get a male heir. Otherwise, he was going to destroy all the temples of all of the religions in the whole country. <coughs> And everybody was very upset. So then Avalokiteshwar went to the Buddha and he said, what good are you radiating infinite light up here in heaven and they're having such a disaster there on earth. There are a bunch of loonies down there and they're going to like all lose all their religions. And this king is going mad and he's going to destroy everything. So why don't you do something about it? And then apparently Amitabha didn't say anything but he did the typical thing that they do and stuck out his tongue. <laughs> and when he stuck out his tongue, this meteor flew out of the tongue and uh, with the sound of the syllable Padma Sambhava. And uh, this meteor landed in a lake in front of the king's palace. And Padma Sambhava was there in the lake in the form of a five-year-old, I think with four companions around him on other lotuses, sitting on a lotus. 
And the minister of the king came and said, Oh, uh, your majesty, I think your prayers have been answered. There's a son for you. And uh, <laughs> then they went and asked him where he was from. And he said, I'm from reality. And I mean, you know, all kinds of poem, mystical thing. And then he was brought up by the king for a while. But then he kind of rebelled and dropped out and uh, went off to be, to be a yogi like Shakyamuni Buddha did. His life mirrors the Buddha, and then it mirrors the Siddhas, you know, these tantric yogis. So he, he became a king, and he sort of did everything. He manifested, and he's still alive, actually, in the Tibetan imagination, uh, at least. And he's uh, sort of in Zanzibar or someplace, Madagascar, some island to the southwest of India. He's living there in a jungle surrounded by cannibals in a copper-colored mountain paradise. Um, maybe Prester John, maybe Ethiopia or something, maybe, yes, who knows where it is. But he's still there, supposedly. And he, he was the one who, when, he, when the first Buddhist monks were trying to build some monasteries in Tibet, sponsored by the king, the local deities who were, used to be, who were war deities and the local nobles didn't like the Buddha. What is this business with the monks and the monasteries and the education and the school? We don't need that. We have our war banners. And so he, they were having a hard time, so they called in him, who was, was a kind of a um, little bit of a shaman, a little bit of a yogi, a little bit of a thaumaturge, I think we people have that expression, with that staff of a yogi that he carried there. And, um, and then he started taming the local deities of Tibet. And, um, and this, this, this is the form in which he's known as his main form. But then he has these other forms. Which, which relate to different parts of his bar. Yes. Which I guess you're going to yeah, we'll have a look at those because the mead tankas are his other forms. Yes. A mixture of immortality. And uh, there's, a, there's a little thing coming out of it, a sort of a rod of dragons, and they're holding up an image of the Buddha, Amitayus, which means infinite life, so that's the elixir of immortality. In his right hand, he holds the Vajra which uh, was originally a Vedic symbol for a thunderbolt and the power of the Vedic god, which was a disruptive a military and, um, and destructive power, actually. And then the Buddhist tantrics reevaluated that symbol to mean compassion. And it, it represents the Buddhist idea that uh, the most powerful energy in the universe is the energy of love and compassion. And then in the crook of his elbow there, standing up, is the Katvanga staff, as it is called, which has a vase, another vase of immortality, a, a Vajra cross pattern underneath that, and then a, sh a sh shrunken head, a dried head, a shrunken head, and a skull, symbolizing the conquest of <coughs> lust, hatred, and ignorance, the three poisons, and to show his sort of mastery, and also the mastery of the inner yoga of the subtle body, and all this kind of thing, from the Zambalaha. And he's really cool. Then the, the blue light behind him, symbolizes the reality of, of liberation and nirvana, the ultimate reality of the universe. And the golden rays in it symbolize his omnipresence as he's a Buddha. He's an emanation of a Buddha. He's an emanated form of a Buddha, but he's a Buddha. And his, the golden line sim, symbolizes his Sambhogakaya, infinite presence as bliss energy within that blue ultimate reality. Um, nirvanic reality. And then this, uh, the, the, the human, humanoid body is his nirmanakaya, which means emanation body, where he's manifesting a certain way to benefit certain types of people. And he has this great cap. It's, I like the cap. Yes, he does. Yeah. This always, ide always identifies him, really. Yeah. Yeah. Eagle feather, it's cut off a bit, but yeah. yeah. his clairvoyant vision, because the eagle has a very far vision, you know, you can see a mouse at like 10 miles. <laughs> Also, he's wearing here the royal robes of Udayana, which is up there in Swat in Afghanistan area. And notice this is the new men style. This is a, a wall painting in the Potala Palace of Padmasambhava. Beautiful brocades of this uh, royal robes and covering over that, of course, this large outer robe that's also uh, got the gorgeous golden, golden tones to it. But this is the way Padmasambhava is usually shown. That outer robe is a Tibetan special thing. Okay. It's lined with um, wool. And it's like a sleeping bag, a sitting up sleep, a meditational uh -huh. sleeping bag. <laughs> and I had one in Dharamsala when I was there years ago, and boy, you really appreciate it. Oh, I, <laughs> I, I needed building in the winter. It's really cool. Now, this is one of the uh, Amherst Tonkas of Padmasambhava uh, in his form called Nima Ozar, which is ray of sunlight, something like yes, that. Sun, or is that? Rays. sun rays. rays the light rays of the sun. Light rays of the sun. 
the, he's, he, he has this form when he meditated for five years in the cemetery called Body's End. Now, all of these eight, eight manifestations of Padmasambhava are forms that he took during his own process of becoming Buddha, basically. And this is one of his earlier manifestations here. And he's, he's in a kind of reddish-orange body, and the texts talk about him being red-faced and so on. He has his katvanga here with only one skull here at this point, and a, but a crown of skulls, which means defeating the five poisons, which are uh, ignorance, uh, desire, yeah, anger, the jealousy and greed and so on. So these are the actually the crown of wrathful, uh, el wrathful forms of the deities. So he's somewhat wearing these wrathful ornaments together with bodhisattva ornaments and very beautiful refined painting style, the linear style of this Numenri school. And this is a Numenri style of painting, but opening up a little more space. It's slightly later in date than the ones I showed you earlier. This must be around uh, early 19th century or so, where it's starting to assimilate some of the aspects of the Karmagadri school, the other school that uses more atmospheric blue sky and so on. So that happens around 1900. But then surrounded by these other interesting attendants. Some of them are protectors down here, and the more lamas at the top here, floating in the sky with the clouds, and some fierce, uh, uh, powerful deities here as well. And these, I think, are the two consorts of Padmasambhava, his uh, Indian consort, Mandarava, and his Tibetan consort, uh, Tsogyal. Yeah. Uh, let me go to another one here. This is the back of that painting. Some of you, I think, might be interested that on the back, Bob, tell us about that then. The back of the paintings, they're often consecrated by having the handprints of, we don't know who in this case exactly, at least not yet, but uh, it's usually some high lama of some sort who is consecrating this, this uh, painting. And then there's an inscription and the mystic syllables here, Om Ah Om. Bob, can you say get anything about this? Uh, well, is the, the inscription below um, is a verse, and probably I can't really read it. Even if I walk close, I try it earlier. Yeah. And I we wrote a little thing about this tanka in the book we did in 1984, but we didn't look at. I didn't look <laughs> at the back, and, and it was, I could have. I was actually seeing it, but probably the name of the person whose handprints are on there is embedded. What they will do is write a verse. And one word in each of the verses will be one of the names, usually four-syllable name. And there'll be four lines in the verse. But I'm sorry, I can't tell you who it is. In the, in the Lenza letters above is probably the famous great mantra of Buddhism, which is considered the epitome of all Buddhism. Yeah. Celebrating the Buddha's discovery of causality. Which is, how, which is the epitome of the Buddha's teaching, that, which is surprising because you think of him as a religious founder, but actually he's celebrated as a discoverer of causality in his own tradition. Because apparently it's a big deal to discover causality, because when you know about the causes of things well, that make things the way they are, then you can interfere with them if the things are bad, and you can make good causes that will make things good. And so rather than being controlled by the gods or the fates or some sort of, some sort of forces of the universe, you understand causation, you can ameliorate the human position in the universe. So that's the main, that is sort of the epitome verse in all Buddhism, and it's usually on the back of it, all tankas, inside stupas, everywhere, om ye dharma hetu brahma And you can see the, tank, the tankas, uh, yeah. Yeah. Probably the name of the guy whose hands are up there, the lama whose hands are up there, but mm -hmm. I'm sorry I can't tell you who it is, and I didn't look at it 25 years ago. <laughs> but it's on the list. <laughs> 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 Also, uh, you can see the tanka is made on cloth. I hadn't mentioned that before, but it's sized cotton, and usually they're framed in, in silk brocades. Now, uh, this is uh, okay, another form. Yeah. Okay. One thing is one yeah. Thing, it's kind of fun. If you see here, there is a om, a, and a hum uh, written in the Sanskrit ornate script. And that is, should be, that is placed. This is placed on the crown of the head of the main figure, mm -hmm. at the throat of the main figure, and at the heart of the main figure. And it symbolizes that the body, speech, and mind of that being 
uh, contain the body, speech, and mind of all Buddhas, um, our home, those three sense of souls. That's on you, that's kind of fun. Yeah. We have animating the energy of the Tantra. Yes, all of these, all of these set of tankas of the five forms, manifestations of Padmasambhava, have that on the back, and also the handprints. This mead set of them is a very rare, important set. This is uh, Loden Chogze, the uh, another form of Padmasambhava, uh, this time in kind of uh, gorgeous robes of a uh, of a king. Yes, and. Uh, well, if you can, I'm just showing you the center part of the tanka, just to show you how beautiful this line is, and so on. Look at the movement of the contours of these. It of the better when you describe it, <laughs> Anyway, it, it's just incredible. The Tibetan artist, I have to tell you how good their line is, because it is absolutely fluent and even, and yet you don't feel that it is forced in any way. It's all, almost as if it appeared by itself by non-human hands somehow. It doesn't seem to have a human hand attached to it, but it has strength and power. And it's like, I like to call it like a wire almost. It has that sense of resiliency and power and energy to it. Now, all of its Tibetan tangas have this energy coming out of it, uh, and very strong realism of the object itself. So there's no doubt about it, and there's no uh, kind of blurring of the edges. Everything is totally crystalline, clear, pure, as is the color, as you can see. Very rich here, and with lots of details for the brocade, making it, again, a kind of sumptuous, uh, sumptuous uh, feast. From the point of view of what I was talking about earlier, sort of the basic Buddhist worldview of the Mahayana or non dualist Buddhist, is the universal vehicle or non dualist Buddhist, is this sort of, which is surprising perhaps to Western people who are not familiar with it, is the, is the, is the imagination in the Mahayanist person of the imminent presence of enlightened beings. In other words, as they understand, the definition of enlightenment means that the being expands beyond the boundary of their individuated sort of sack of skin, and they perceive themselves as all the, as all the energies in the universe. Uh -huh. And yet, they remain specifically aware of the condition of different things in the universe, so therefore they can emanate, or incarnate, if you will, any kind of form that will be helpful to different beings who are perceiving their blissful universe as a place of suffering. And so, you know, in the West there's this idea like Jesus is the Son of God and there's the one Son and he's in the one place. Like I, I can't tell you how many Tibetan Lamas I translated for an interreligious dialogue and they kept asking these theologians like, how can an omnipotent God only have one guy in one place at one time? <laughs> <laughs> like, what's the their vision of it is that you know the, the Buddha minds, the enlightened beings, their minds are sort of in the subatomic energies everywhere, like right here in this place. And if they, if it was good for us, if we needed it, they would manifest out of the pure energy here whatever embodiment would be a mirror to us of our own higher potential, something like that. So it's just I'm just I'm not saying it's correct or not. It may be a delusion, but I'm just saying <laughs> that. That that's the richness of their vision of the sort of power of compassion and love in the universe manifested by many enlightened beings, by the infinite numbers of enlightened beings. And therefore this one problem some of them, that he has eight emanations just only mean that they're the eight main emanations mm -hmm. that are sort of different types and archetypes. But he has infinite numbers of emanations, in other words, and because he's supposedly a Buddha. Well, the, the Tibetan painting and art in general, Tibetan painting and art in general, actually, is so intense, and you can feel that here, too. That's these energies that seem to be embodied within that. Somehow the artist can get that, and it seems to just emanate, flow out of the image, along with all of these uh, scarves and other things. But And, uh, yeah, transparent, transparent yeah, plant here, flower, yeah, on the altar in front. Yes. <laughs> Another form that we'll see in the in the galleries of the uh, wrathful form of Padmasambhava is uh, Senge, uh, Senge, Senge, Guru Senge Dragpo, Dradog, Dradog, sorry. And here the lamas at the top again, uh, 
quite a bit em occupying the space with clouds behind them, and yet you see, of course, the uh, atmosphere and the, uh, the conical mountains with their little trees and so on, all in the Numenri style. Gorgeous uh, yellow, I mean, or orangey yellowish flames here behind. Uh, and again, you see this activity and sense of just exploding with some kind of inner energy coming outward, yet under control. It's not out of control, but it's so intense that it just, the fire just seems to be alive, as is the posture of the image. And he's got a snow lion on, a, on his back. This is uh, the skin of a snow lion here that he wears around his back. Here. They're very unusual. Most uh, other uh, wrathful deities have skins of elephants or uh, they wear tiger skin, something like that. But a snow lion is uh, for Padmasambhava special. And this down here is Ganapati. This is Ganesh, the great uh, Hindu god uh, to get rid of uh, obs obs obstructions and so on. This is called the great red Ganesh with uh, multiple arms. Here. So sometimes he appears also here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then these are the long life goddesses. Tsaringba and her sisters here are here. A few of them. Yeah. Okay. And lastly, the one that would be in the center of a mandala of eight of Ma Padmasambhava's manifestations is the, uh, this image at the right, which is the uh, Udayana Ch uh, Dorje Chang, Vajradhara, Vajradhara, Yabyam, with uh, the special uh, caveat of being from Udayana. So this is Padmasambhava connected to his roots in Udayana and yet as the mystic Buddha Vajradhara. Others here, Manjusri, Bodhisattva of Wisdom, Sarasvati, the goddess of learning and wisdom and or poetry and music. And here's a lama that, I don't know who he is, but he's a ray, of, ray from the sun is penetrating his body and coming out the other side. And at the top is none other than Tsongkhapa, who is the head or founder of the Galugpa order. And yet, Padmasambhava was the founder of the Nyingma order. So here is a Galugpa lama in a Nyingmapa painting. This shows the coordination or the very interesting uh, historical evidences of the fifth Dalai Lama's bringing together the Nyingma order and the Galugpa order and how that remains even to the present day as an important feature of Galugta, Galugpa practice. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a, that is an element of the, especially of the Dalai Lama. Uh, they, they're very fond of the Nyingma tradition starting with the fifth Actually, the third also was very much into it. And, uh, uh, you know, this sort of non-sectarian attitude, although I call the different Tibetan groups orders, not sect, because they don't really fit the definition of a Protestant sect. But they are like Franciscan Dominican orders. It's really a better word for their divisions, you know. And that's, this is a wonderful one. One of the things about these fierce-looking horsemen deities around there is that they are usually, they have an origin story where they were some kind of Tibetan mountain spirit, very ferocious and so on. And uh, the great yogi um, and the great adept, um, Padmasambhava, they never kill those demons, they tame them, mm -hmm. which means they sort of, they kind of transfix them with their energy and put them in place, like put them in the classroom then lecture them interminably, <laughs> and then, uh, then, they, then they get them to work for them. So then the fierce deities are protecting the community, and they are and they're accepting vegetarian offerings, or blood offerings, <laughs> and they're behaving themselves, you know, they're becoming vegans and so on. <laughs> and uh, they, never put it, they never put it to waste, you know, they even try to transmute evil into doing good work, you know. That's, a, that's a, you know, the typical trope, you know, in the, in the tradition. I think you could clearly hear, see, by juxtaposing these two paintings, these two great traditions of the late 18th and early 19th century, the new memory tradition with its vivacity and its uh, feeling of movement and richness of 
texture and color, and the Karmagadri, which is rather cool and seem to show the essence of things, but to still draw you in to the atmosphere and to create a kind of peaceful aura, one would say. This is the birth of the Buddha here. So very just small hints of the narrative going on, whereas the new memory formed by Choying Gyatso, and mainly the basis of most of the uh, Hamilton Tankas here at Amid, shows this uh, density and complexity of forms. Maybe I should say one thing about the male-female union, for those who are not familiar with it, is that um, the Buddha, uh, the bliss of Nirvana is, is through these male-female unions, is uh, a metaphor for the bliss of Nirvana in the sense that the orgasmic bliss, which is the highest form of ordinary bliss, uh, but, uh, but it's, it's like a symbol or a doorway for the much greater bliss that is sort of universal, where, the, where it's like the universe is, is one big orgastic uh, uh, experience, uh, the great embrace of all things, where the tenderness and gentleness and meltingness of, of self and other uh, are perceived on a cosmic scale. And that is the meaning of the symbol of the, of the uh, uh, orgasmic couple in union like that. And we're going to see in a minute a painting where you have a Buddha, a monk Buddha there, who on one level has abandoned ordinary sexuality, and yet is also in the same experience of blissful interconnectedness in the universe. And he has in his heart, he has this male-female, mm -hmm. which therefore symbolizes the union of the male and female elements within each being in that each male has a female side, each female has a male side, and when they really melt, if they melted together, then that being would feel, uh, would experience the universe in a different way, something like that. The, 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 the aroused and the contented and the blissful nervous system, you could say, is a symbol of that. Mm -hmm. Now, the bead also has tankas that we would call kind of folk uh, type of tradition, quite different from the very high class, uh, refined tankas we've been looking at of Padmasambhava's manifestations and so on, which are really uh, aristocratic, very high class um, paintings from the probably a city of Lhasa, the Lhasa school. But out in the eastern Tibet, probably calm that area, you might have traveling artists going around and producing these kind of paintings for the local people. And so you get a very bold and sketchy style. It's almost very forthright without any clear uh, attachment to either the New Menry School or the Kamargadri School. Just the kind of mixture of all of it and done in a very simple but forthright manner. Now this is uh, Kubera, the deity of wealth, sitting on his white snow lion here. Bob, maybe you you like to talk about what he's... He has a mongoose here in his left hand. He's a god. He's the guardian king of the north. It's like the Buddhist Santa Claus. <laughs> and he has a... He has, you can't really see it, but he's holding a mongoose here who is believed... You know, mongoose goes and gets a snake and then snakes are coiled around treasures in the earth. It's a sort of legendary conceit. And, uh, and any time he wants to produce wealth for a monastery or for a kingdom or for some or for a nation... He squeezes the mongoose and out pops the red folk obligation. <laughs> 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 Although a real one, not a fake one, like Golden Anyway, this is, um, they, they, they all carry, wealth ladies always carry jewel, this jewel vomiting mongoose. <laughs> Very useful thing, apparently, when you fundraise. <laughs> 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 He's accompanied here by eight horsemen attendants them all just lined up like great toys here, but they are uh, very, very bright red in a landscape that really just sort of, again, puts us uh, in a surrealistic kind of feeling here, where the mountains one right after the other lap over each other, and then the, somehow the land turns into the sky and becomes the same. So it is just without, again, any kind of, of uh, forced transition, but we're feeling that there's something a little strange with this natural world, and yet it's still naturalistic. So it's, it's you know, it's very powerful painting, it's simplistic, it's forthright, uh, and it has, uh, it's clear iconography and so on, but it is more of the folk tradition, but very, very nice one. This one, too, is one of probably eastern Tibet in the Kham region, which is uh, not the sophisticated center of 
uh, courtly painting or the high class painting. But this is the bardo, which is I want Bob to explain that. Explain that one to you. The bardo. The between state after death. And uh, in the later week of the between state, then you, if you have not um, gone into the heart of the enlightened being through vi through peaceful visions of, of mild visions of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, then the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas start showing themselves in this terrific or fierce winged angel form, mm. three-faced, six-armed usually with wings in the consort, and they um, and then you have to like overcome your, to help you overcome your fear because you're beginning to wander down into more frightening areas of the universe in your quest of, uh, of embodiment because you're freaking out because you're in this dreamlike state and you're having like frightening experiences because you didn't go right away toward the peaceful thing, the mild thing, because uh, you didn't meditate enough and do enough yoga in your life. <laughs> so then these guys try to come and get you out of the, out of the, you know, the riots and the whatever, the difficulties. And they try to frighten, show a powerful form to encourage you that they're there to protect you and they have the ability and power to do so. And so that's a, this is this is the fierce days of the between state, the martyr mm. state. You yeah. can look up in the Book of the Dead how they are described and so on. Anyway, this one has a sense of kind of flickering light and flame, and it's not very precisely painted and so on, but it has an an aura of some uh, direct kind of engagement with these creatures with animal heads and dancing around here and all the different uh, uh, winged winged herukas or fierce deities. A few Buddhas up here at the top. There's a kind of smoky, otherworldly feeling to it that this uh, artist has somehow captured very, very nicely. It's kind of scary, but the reason, it isn't that they are scary, it is that the person in the state between life and re death and rebirth is in a stage themselves where they're hallucinating wild animals chasing them, they're hallucinating hellish conditions and frightening things. And so these are, these, are, these are manifestations of helpful beings, guiding beings who come and show themselves to look stronger than the frightening things and then can protect them from it is the idea, supposedly. Yeah. Now this is the last one, and this is a big one, and uh, the Amherst Collection has two big ones of this Gelugpa refuge tree with a whole array of images, as you see, on a large tree that comes from an ocean-like lake here, very low on the horizon. So your eye goes up this tree trunk to along the central axis. Everything always, the important uh, alignment is the central axis. And then uh, to either side, and, and Bob should tell you about these, are various clusters of lamas right and so on. This right side is the compassion lineage. Uh -huh. Magnificent deeds of the Bodhisattva. On the left side is the wisdom lineage of profound vision of the Bodhisattva. Mm -hmm. And all these tantric uh, high divinities here in Yabyam postures are arrayed beneath. The different Buddhas, the 32 Buddhas of Confession, 35 Buddhas of Confession, yeah. And Arhats down there. Arhats and protectors and so saints. on. Those are the Buddhist saints of the dualistic Buddhism. And now this last one, this is to show you this Tsongkhapa image, and here you can see the detail, incredible detail in these uh, paintings. Uh, and th this is what we want to show you here, is, is inside his heart is Shakyamuni, and Bob says also in Shakyamuni's heart is Vajradhara, is that right? Vajradhara, the male-female union one. Yeah. So you're getting multiple levels of interior. So shown to you at the same time as you see his exterior. So it's the interior exterior the combined. The book on the lotus over his left shoulder is the Prajna Paramita, the transcendent wisdom, um, the book of the what's called the Mother of All Buddhas, the teaching of emptiness and compassion, wisdom and compassion. And on the right side is the flaming sword that is a symbol of critical wisdom that cuts apart the tangled knots of the samsara of this world of suffering. And so that's a symbol of mantra that and it's a symbol that he is a he is an emanation of the Bodhisattva Manju Shri who specializes on the wisdom side of things. So this is a magnificent, very rare, I need to stress that, there are not many of these large, big Galupa refuge trees uh, in existence. And Amherst College has two of them. And you'll see one for each exhibition, the fall and the next spring.
Now, at this point, we'll open it up to the audience for any questions that you might like to have. His right hand is held up in the, not, that's not the Pap's blue ribbon sign, that's the sign <laughs> that's trying to find discernment, philosophical discrimination, and insight. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to know, um, give us an explanation about so much veneration whenever you see a, a video or something, you, you see incredible veneration of, uh, you know, monks and nuns and monks. Uh, um, you want to know why there's so much generation? Veneration. Veneration. Veneration of lamas and so on. Of, or of lamas and monks oh, and yeah. these kind of things in the a Tibetan little, tradition. Uh, actually, a lot of the, genera of the veneration is for show. <laughs> you know, like some Tibetans will come up to the Dalai Lama and, <laughs> and they get all pious, you know, and then they go out and have a beer. <laughs> So they, they're very earthy, lively, happy, cheerful people. But the veneration comes from gratitude. They feel that these teachers remind them of the basic goodness of the universe, actually. Because that is Buddha's discovery. You know, this whole thing about the poor pope, previous pope, although actually it was Cardinal Ratzinger who wrote that chapter, where he wrote that, how can anybody be a Buddhist? All they do is suffer. It's such a terrible religion. They're just suffering all the time. You know, he was very upset because he was, I guess, more cheery in Rome with his Gucci loafers. <laughs> <laughs> he has special red Gucci loafers. Which I'm sure are very <laughs> and the point is that this, this is a general view of Buddhism, but that Buddhism is the opposite. As I said, his discovery, the only real reality among the Four Noble Truths, is the third one, which is the truth of Nirvana, the freedom from suffering, the cessation of suffering. And uh, so, the, so Buddhists are very cheerful, and because they, they associate their lamas with the manifestation of the presence of those enlightened beings who gave them the instructions about how not to be a big pain <laughs> to others and therefore to have, and be nice to their moms and stuff and therefore have a nice <laughs> life. <laughs> therefore, they venerate, they venerate those lamas. They're grateful. You know? Why do I? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a wasba, you know. When I used to teach her at Amherst, our department secretary, our sainted department secretary, kind of liked my look because I had a Harris Street jacket and I looked pretty waspy. She kept saying, well, now, where do you go on Sunday? You know? <laughs> Finally, I said, look, I'm a wasp, not a wasp. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then, after 20 years of like, studying this, and I still don't understand it, really. But, you know, after 20 years of it, and learning a little bit more to listen to my wife, <laughs> then I'm more cheery. And so then I feel <laughs> veneration for the Dalai Lama. Thanks, you know. Because you helped me find out some, some educative thing that were a little bit better for my barbarian mind than poor old Socrates taking his hemlock milkshake. <laughs> and, uh, and whoever can you know. So they feel that they feel gratitude. That's the veneration comes from them. They were cheery, but they, you know, they 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 became a more peaceful culture. Not perfect. They weren't Shangri-La, Shambhala, which they believe there is such a place, but it isn't Tibet. They know very well themselves it isn't. It's somewhere up in the North Pole, some magic hidden place, <laughs> where they hope that we'll come and help them restore their country someday in about 400 years from now. And uh, so, but it was a much more peaceful place. Can you imagine what America would be like if all the Rambos in America were Zen, Zen trained? <laughs> instead of killing and slaughtering people, and instead of rockets, flare, red flare, and the bombs bursting in air, we had like people doing all money, paying at home and paying tantas. And Amherst College wasn't only for the elite, but there was Amherst Colleges in Harlem, and in South Side Chicago, and in, and in the West Side in Los Angeles, whatever it's called. And because there was enough money to do that, instead of paying, spending all the money in the Pentagon, what would America be like? It would be totally different. 20%, 15% of Americans were like seeking enlightenment, even if many of them were a bunch of dumbos who weren't finding it and they were playing, <laughs> playing cards in the cell of the monastery. The fact that the institution was making them do it would cheer up the country. <laughs> Don't you think? Venerate, then we'd venerate 
great Amherst professors, instead of thinking of them as like a bunch of wimps in ivory towers. Who should, who should like, you know, have their salaries cut by the Republicans. Yes. Yes. She's a question for me, but she's very cheered up by what you said. <laughs> Thank you. So, this title of the New Memory School. Yes. Can you explain why it's called that and how that relates to other schools? You compared the one school that occurs at the same time in history. Yes. But is there an old memory school, or you know, what what is that label signifying in relation to? This? Okay, great. Yes, yes. Uh, there is actually a memory because we have a new memory coming out in the 17th century. The memory school starts in the 15th century and is the, the artist called Menla was uh, a person who, it, yeah, who integrated the natural landscape into Tankas uh, in his painting for the first time. Before that, it was all the Indo-Nepalese tradition, which was the two-dimensional icon without real space and landscape. No one explained that better than Marilyn Reed. <laughs> no, she did. And all those people who brought them out of Indian art, you know, Marilyn Reed, that's Chinese, what did she say? She actually straightened out the insight into Tibetan art. Uniquely, she is the best. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anyway, Menry, Menry was, was very difficult to follow, to emulate. He was so great with his painting of naturalistic landscape and so on. The 16th century had kind of died out. No one could compete with it, could, could follow him. But then Cho Ying Gyatso in the 17th century revived Menry's, Menla's style of painting, and he was called the New Menry, the New Menry School. And, and what he did, what Merrill was talking what he did was the original Sanjay Menla, that painter who worked for Ketrukje, talking about the cycle in the 15th century, he put these like amazing creatures, you know, these lamas or deities, those unbelievable, incredible, exquisite deities, and he put them out of that hieratic temple wall indoors, you know, like from India and Nepal, and he put them in the Chinese landscape. And the Tibetan, which, you know, because the Tibetans, and the, that's the whole Tibetan thing is this kind of bridge. It's this amazing rainbow bridge between the Indian and the Chinese culture that they did in history. You know, their language does it, and their art does it, their food does it, and they love the Chinese. You know, the Chinese would just tear up and take a hike to Venice and would cheer them up a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of like, oh, the Venice is so scary. <laughs> oh, we're scared of that Dalai Lama. He's going he's gonna to do, I don't know what he's going to do. He's going to really like overthrow that Politburo. <laughs> <laughs> That synthesis of India, Indian and Chinese thing. Tibet is like this place where they meet, when it's a free place, where they meet in a free thing, where they neither one dominates the other, and they interconnect and create tremendous beauty and creativity, generativity, as you said. I like that. As you said. There's, there's sort of a follow-up okay. question sure. going on over here. Well, actually, there are two. One is the spelling of Mendry, because I think we were all hearing it as new memory, being ignorant over here and not. Oh, M E N R I. M E N R I. Menri. Yeah. It comes from Menla. Menla. Medicine yeah. Buddha. And Rimo, which, which is the name of the guy. And then Rimo, which means painting. So the Medicinal healing painting. That's <laughs> that was his name, Sanjay. The Buddha healing painter. That's good. You had another one? <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Um, okay. This is the last one. Last question. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, at various points, I'm, I'm curious about the horse men or women, because many times in these tongas you have three horse people, and then there's another one that's different, like on a mule or on. But yes, yes. On, on the bottom side. So yes, the the. Uh -huh. Usually, yes. Bob was talking about those horse men, and you mentioned in another tonga them as horse women, and. I'm wondering what those differences were and what those, um, Bob was talking about them as sort of the, these um, traveling mountain people uh, being envisioned that way. But I sort of wanted to get a little clear picture of the envisioning from the art historical point of view. 
Well, I think horses are used both for, for male deities and female deities, like these Theringma and her sisters, for example. Yeah, the goddesses of the mountains, yeah. So they would ride the Himalayan horse, I suppose. But there's Pandan Lama who rides a mule, so that is her vehicle or a horse. I don't know why it's a mule. Kali, yeah. So it all depends on the origins of these myths and or how their stories uh, get incorporated and where they come from and so on. But yes, the, the vehicle is important. Who you ride, what you ride. It oftentimes identifies a deity, actually, what kind of vehicle they're riding. Okay, well, thank you all so much. It's been a wonderful afternoon.